Okay, uh, let me start with a general question um, I've, um, about the, the present state of music uh, in general or classical or contemporary music. There is a wonderful uh, idea I read, um, which was said by John Cage in 1992, just before his death. He said that we live in a time I think not of mainstream, but of many streams, or even if you insist upon a river of time, that we have come to a delta, maybe even beyond the delta to an ocean, which is going back to the skies. Um, so what do you think about the, this idea of music history being over? No, I don't agree, I'm afraid. Um, if we went to see Verdi in 1890 or 1880 said, what do you think of the contemporary music? Maybe he would have said, my God, there's Wagner. Well, there has been Wagner. And then um, there's this Russian school. And soon he could see in the future, there's going to be this French school. And then there's going to be everybody around the world writing their own music, De Fire, <laughs> if you could see into Crystal Ball and Vaughan Williams and Copeland and Bartok and Kodai and Janacek and Sibelius and Nielsen, etc., I would say history will decide what it wants to keep and what it won't want to keep. And in the meantime, as long as it's of a high quality, the more diversity, the better. So I, I do understand it must seem a little bit confusing for people, but at least from me, from my point of view, I'm oblivious to the things I don't like and very much conscious of the things I do like. And that's enough. <laughs> uh, but but uh, what do you think about the, the role of the composer in the, in, in the contemporary society? Because that changed a lot. So if you compare like what the role of Verdi was in Italy in the 19th century or Brahms' role in Vienna or Bartók's role in, in Budapest, uh, or, or so, what, what do you think about um, about being an important composer? That's for you, for you to say, not for me to to say. In some ways, we are very spoilt. Brahms did not have um, YouTube. His works would not be sent across the world with the speed that you can do it now. Uh, performances, recordings, so many televisions, videos, so many things are extraordinary. I suppose the 19th century adored, the, in the middle of Central Europe, adored their composers. Um, their only rivals were philosophers in the public's uh, uh, view of what was of incredible importance. And they came at a moment of expanding middle class expansion of musical horizons and of a particularly learned in musical public who were learning could read music could perform it at home and were looking for heroes maybe at least Wagner hoped to take on an almost a semi-religious function it's not like that today how could it be in our world it's just impossible to imagine that and I don't think necessarily it would be a positive thing to imagine it. When you hear of early 20th century composers, Wolf and Scriabin, say, behaving like mid 19th century great geniuses, it, it already feels wrong. On the other hand, from my point of view, there are some great composers in the recent past who are as great as the composers from the more distant past. And in the end, again, history write the most beautiful music you can, have the good fortune to have it performed, if not a vast amount of times, at least at a very high level. And uh, what more can we want? Um, you are both a conductor uh, and a composer um, and a pianist. Uh, how do these different activities uh, affect each other? much less than you might imagine. It never ceases to amaze me how far the activity of a conductor is far is so distant from that of a composer. It's almost like the difference between a sports person and a philosopher. It's uh, we 
to, to learn to conduct a piece properly, I have to analyze it. I have to understand it, how it how it's made, how it functions, its harmonic and rhythmical languages, its structure, mm. how the timbre work, and, and how it functions in space on the platform. And that's very useful to the composer, quite useful to the composer. But the rest of it is so different. A piece for me can take two, three years to write. A lot of that time is spent in complete isolation and silence, alone, just with my thoughts, trying to hear what I'm doing to the greatest precision I can. And sometimes two or three months will go by and I don't manage to necessarily to write a bar that I want to keep. I turn up at an orchestra. We start rehearsing the next day. Three or four days later, there's the concert. And I'm there with 100 people in front of me. And we hope in the concert, 2,000 people behind me. And it is the most, and it's physically uh, it, it requires physical effort and physical um, uh, public communication, uh, awareness of the people in front of me, how to manage the rehearsal, how to manage time, how to manage them, how to manage myself. It is so different. Um, some people, some very remarkable people can compose and conduct at the same time, not exactly the same time, but in the evening in the hotel they can compose. I can't do that. It takes me one or two or three weeks to return to the inner life I need to, to compose. So the answer is they're incredibly far apart and there are points of interest, of course. I learn from my mistakes intimately when I'm conducting my own pieces and I take enormous joy of performing. I was in Berlin and in Hamburg recently working with two ensembles that I truly love, the Ensemble Modern, Frankfurt and the Mahler Chamber Orchestra and the play I'm still glowing from the pleasure of making music with them but it, it's not it's so far from composing. But does it help you technically like if you if you invent a sound uh, and you put it on the orchestra uh, does it work better with the knowledge of the conductor? Yes and no. It is helpful. It all by also learning pieces. I discover new instruments: the contrabass clarinet, the contrabass trombone, the basset horn, the cymbalum. Instruments that I can then have intimate contact with. I can write for perhaps probably better than uh, I did, could before. But it's not necessary. Two candidates for the greatest composer of the last fifty years: Messiaen, my teacher, and Ligeti. They didn't conduct at all and look at how wonderful their music is. So it's it's not necessary. It's a great pleasure. It's a huge pleasure. Plus I was always a musician who made music when I was a child, so I would miss it too much, but it's not, it's not essential. I tell you the one thing that perhaps does inform my work and has done now for 30, more than 30 years is teaching. Having to teach young composers and having to analyze music in, in depth, more depth, perhaps at least in a composer's way, more than a conductor's way. That has, um, that has fed me and given me lots of ideas, yeah. Plus, there is the duty of the composer to truly hear what they write already in there. And you, it's one takes potential pleasure in hearing it live, but you can hear it inside your head. I, I, I'm, I'm aware just recently someone, you've had a performance in Budapest. There's a piece of mine being played tonight and I spoke to the conductor, a friend of mine, um, and he, I think, went to hear Das Lied von der Erde, Mahler, played by Ivan Fischer, I think, in just a day or two ago. What a wonderful, beautiful, wonderful, great score. Mar the composer never heard it. It's tragic, but it, it doesn't stop it being a great piece. Um, the fact that you, you... You said that you need complete isolation to, to compose. Uh, but there are these periods when you conduct and you teach. Um, the, the fact that you, 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 you spend a lot of time with other music, how does it affect your own uh, composition? Well, I, I've spent my life with other music. I write music because I love music. I love all sorts of music. I've been listen I, I, uh, going back centuries and not only from, from Europe. But it's very simple. When I'm composing, I, I stop listening. I don't go to concerts. I don't go to operas. I, I don't go in here if their performances are my works. So I almost never go. 
and I avoid music, I'm afraid. I want my own music to form inside my head. And if I listen to some Wagner or something I is really invasive like that, I can't get it out of my head. So it's very, very negative. So, yeah, I, I but I'm a bit weird, I suspect, in that way of the degree of isolation that I create for myself when I write. But it's what I, it's what I, I've discovered it's what I need. Peter Utvers said once that he doesn't want to memorize the scores uh, so that it wouldn't affect too much his own compositional thinking. Because you can avoid going to concerts, but you cannot you cannot get rid of your memories of music. No, and neither would I want to. And they're always there. You write a note, you're aware of the shadows behind that note. And there are many, obviously, vast quantities. But at the same time, I like the idea of remaining embedded within a school while trying to create it. it it's so complex, so many aspects, the harmony, the rhythm, the form, the material, how it grows, how it interacts, particularly when you're writing for orchestra. It's so complex. I try to keep myself, as it were, independent from every, I try, I'm not necessarily possible to do it, but it's different from hearing a wonderful performance of a work that you love. And then you, then you, it, your memories as it were heated up again. And sometimes it's hard to get rid of them. Now, I, I doesn't mean I'm going to start writing that piece. I've just listened when I've, um, wake up in the morning, but it's very likely that music will be sounding in my head in the morning. And that's just irritating. <laughs> it's not helpful. It's not helpful. You, I do believe that you really have to imagine the, the truth of how a piece sounds while you're writing it. And that means you have to live within that sound. It's locked into your head and anything you can do to help that is appreciated. So staying clear of other music for some time, unfortunately, is one of the things that helps me. Uh, is it possible to explain to non-composer people how uh, the work on a composition starts? So for, for you, is it inspiration or you just work like Thomas Mann who sat down to the desk and worked and worked and then threw it out if it was bad, but he worked every time on a regular basis? Or is it a frenzy when you you have the ideas? So... Can you share your experience of the compositional process? It's interesting you mentioned Thomas Mann because I'm a great fan of his writing. And after my concerts in Hamburg, I went for one day to Lübeck, his hometown, which is extraordinarily beautiful. And it was moving for me to see this wonderful town, which I know so well from his writing. He's right, he's correct, to work every day and throw away. That is a very good way to do it. I used to think when I was young, inspiration strikes suddenly, you receive a sound and then you slowly create it in reality. I, I don't really believe that anymore now. I think, I do believe in inspiration. And in, in any case, I know there's been periods in my life when I have felt inspired and others when I really haven't. And if I don't feel some degree of inspiration, I can't work, I, I can't work. But inspiration isn't something which comes free. I think you have to work at logic, at composition, at craft, and then as a gift it comes once you're ready. Um, I have to say that particularly when I'm writing an orchestral piece, it can take a very long time before I'm happy with the first notes that, that I write. And, and the, the Thomas Mann um, efforts will sometimes last six months or a year before I start keeping things. And then conversely, when I'm in the second half of a piece, I compose with such fluency and speed that it, it shocks me. Um, I can't sleep anymore. I just write and half a piece will be written in two, in two weeks. And the, 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 the process between there and the distance from how I began is, is amazing. What, one thing I, I've learned is that every creative person is different. Um, Graham Greene, the English author, he used to work like that. He used to write, in fact, something like 2,000 words every day and, and keep it. Um, Stravinsky would write work every day and he would start at work and finish at 1.30 in the afternoon, have lunch and then have the rest of the time going to parties and going to the movies. 
Um, some people I was with in Wolf Wolfgang Riem in Frankfurt rehearsing his wonderful Jagden and Foreman uh, two weeks ago, and he's written 500 pieces. So his way of writing is incredibly different from mine. I think you, the best thing for a composer is to learn your sensibility and your, your personal rhythm, then accept it and then do the best you can with it. <laughs> Uh, you teach uh, composition at the, the Royal College of Music. Um, may I correct? So, excuse me, it's King's College London. King, Sorry. I used to teach 20 oh. years ago. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, two of our great masters, Bartok and Kurtag, never taught composition. They, they said that it was impossible. They, they, Kurtag taught chamber music, Bartok taught piano. Uh, how can you teach composition? What, what do you actually teach? I was very fortunate. I had wonderful teachers when I was young. A man called Peter Gellhorn, a refugee from the Nazis, came to the UK in the 30s. He was my first real teacher. And then I went to the, the greatest of my teachers, Messiaen in Paris, which was the most wonderful thing. And then Alexander Gur, who was the son of a Schoenberg student, um, also in a different way, wonderful. You cannot make someone a musician You cannot make someone creative and you cannot create a composer, but you can help them. You can help the mind, you can help the heart and you can help the ear above and the craft above all. So that's what my teachers did for me. They made me hear better. They made me imagine better. They made me understand music with more depth, I, I think, and um, more critically. And they opened up new avenues for me, structural, formal, philosophical ones, which are incredibly useful. Um, and now as a teacher myself, I can understand why Messiaen used to say to me that he, he taught because he, firstly, he loved to teach, and secondly, because he learned so much. I can really understand that. And I, I'm absolutely aware if someone can't compose, there's nothing I can do to help them. And if someone composes really very uninterestingly and unimaginatively, I can't help at all. But if someone does seem to have an imagination and some spirit and some uh, character and also has a musical, uh, musical imagination, but they lack sufficient hearing or sufficient definition in what they want, then for a short time I can help because I can challenge them, I can challenge their mind, their ear, their craft, their sense of form and I think I think a teacher can can really help. By the way you mentioned the name of Kurtag, one of the reasons I'm very sad I can't come to Budapest next month is I've only met Kurtag about four or five times, once in London, I think in Paris and once in Berlin but we have been in contact quite a lot these last few years and in a very cordial, very nice way. And I was greatly looking forward to visiting him. And sadly, uh, as well as participating in Peter Elfish's marvelous uh, scheme for young composers and conductors. So I, I am very, I'm very sad about that, that I won't be able to see him and, and, gr and greet him. Um, the, you, you, you said in different interviews that the greatest genre in music is opera for you. Um, but you got really... Uh, late uh, to opera, so compared to Mozart or Rossini or uh, or other great opera composers, but even you were younger than Rameau, for example, because Rameau was <laughs> 50. Uh, so how did you get to opera so late if it was that important for you? Yes, the case of Rameau gives me um, <laughs> comfort <laughs> and also a composer of whom I have extremely prof uh, profound uh, uh, admiration, Janacek. Or Mr. Who, Kurtak, who wrote his first opera. Yes, yes, yes uh, absolutely. And Messiaen, my teacher as well, yes. Um, I was born in the theatre musically in a way because I was very fortunate at my school between the age of 13 and 17 that we used to do theatre, plays that needed music. And I often wrote that music and scored that music myself and chose an ensemble of eight, 15 players and would conduct it and would create the parts and would hear it. And that taught me a lot about orchestration before I was really conscious as a, as a composer, before I was grown up. But also it gave me the feeling for the theatre, the tension and the drama in the theatre and the feeling of having an audience behind me and the waiting for the music to start and, and stop. And then I went to Paris and I took part in the, the, 
the world of contemporary music then, which basically was very, very far from music theatre. There was a real chasm there. And so it took me time to change my language. It took me a long time to be ready to collaborate with someone else and to find someone wonderful like Martin Crimp that I've eventually found 15 years ago. And uh, yeah, it took me more time than I wanted and all the time I was wanting to do opera. Uh, but when I did start writing opera, there was that the background of my childhood in the theatre but also I had learned some techniques and I had learned perhaps hopefully enough to fill a whole evening on, on all, you know, all sorts of ways. I got to know the voice better. We composers, we know very little about singing today unless you make a special effort. And um, so it's true, it, I had to wait a long time, but I'm so grateful that I've been able to do it because I, I've always, always loved opera. Uh, ever since my childhood, and it would have been so sad for me if I had never had the chance to write one. And why do you prefer opera to all the other genres? Well, what, what, is, the, what is the miracle of, of this genre? I love all music, almost all music, and therefore I, it's a little bit, uh, you know, I loved going to concerts where, as I was a little boy, and I still love the life of concerts. But opera moves me more than anything else. Um, the few greatest operas that are particularly close to my heart, they move me in, in a good performance, in a tra in an, I always forget, in a transcendental way that shocks me. And there's something about the mixture of theatre and music, which has some, it has some magic. It, it, I think it has the, the, the collision between the, the tragic nature of mankind and um, the, the uh, investigation of the most deep and sometimes most difficult things in our nature through music and through singing, that holds a mysterious, magical power, um, incantatory power, that it's very difficult to, un to explain. I, I just, my own personal experience, it has it's just shown me that, uh, that I'm more moved by Wozzeck or Pelias or Boris, than anything that I read or attend or look at, uh, despite the fact I love all the other arts, but nothing moves me as intensely as that. So that's why I, I, uh, I have said, I express extreme enthusiasm, plus as a performer and a composing performer, the joy of, of working for three months in the rehearsals before the premiere and the process of putting it together is so thrilling with the singers and the piano version and the director and the lighting and the, and the orchestra. And it's so exciting. It's so, when it goes well, it's such an extraordinary process. So that's why. Your, your two uh, full, full length operas both take their subject matter from the middle ages. Yes. Uh, what, what does, I mean, what, what does attract you to, to, to this period? The third one, the first one as well, Into the Little Hill is the oh. same, actually. They're in the Middle Ages, but they're not. Because firstly, any story which is alive is today. Secondly, Martin's liber uh, texts for my operas are full of anachronisms that make it very, very clear to the listener that we are lis we're, we're, re we're recreating an ancient world specifically for today's world. We're not pretending like 19th century medieval operas or early ones that we're taking you back there. But there's another thing. This has happened by accident. It's just that Martin and I seem to have been fired by these, by stories which have a very long past and, and cast a very big shadow. And there is one thing. For me, opera in the end, despite there being a few completely gorgeous comedies, it is a serious medium and it talks about universal aspects of love, death, power, jealousy, really crucial elements of, of the human existence. If the story seems to come from a far away in time, curiously, paradoxically, the, the message or the, the issues involved, for me, are potentially more powerful. 
because they're not distracted by the anecdotal, things that are too close, things that may even be contemporary and that we have our own predetermined views on them or prejudices. So they, the, the long shadow invites a greater sense of depth and moves opera towards the, the, the universal, the mythic, which, I th which it was invented for initially. Um, the other thing is invented imagined worlds very far from me beckon my imagination because of the magic of the unknown and uh, they get me composing and that I can't in the end explain at least up to now um, your piece uh, three inventions will be performed at the concert of, of the festival Cafe Budapest and you were supposed to to work with the, the musicians on this on this piece um, I, I read uh, read the, the piece in New Yorker about where you said um, you called in Messi and that he told you that you, you shouldn't talk about your pieces, which I found really funny because he wrote full length books about his own music. So, but could you please just give an introduction to this, to this very piece for the Hungarian public? Um, Messi meant don't compose, don't talk about your pieces while you're composing them. And I was always secretive as a child and wouldn't, by nature, wouldn't want to talk to my music teachers or anybody while I was writing. I felt it was my private cocoon, my private little imaginative world. Until it's finished, it's, it, I don't need to talk about it. And his views influenced me up to a point by making my viewpoint even stronger. So I, I, I do not talk about what I'm writing. Um, once a piece is finished, I'm very happy to talk about it. Um, at the end of Messiaen's life, uh, the last time I saw him, he said to me that he regretted that he'd written so much and that maybe he should have said less. Um, so I don't write to talk much about what I do. But as for the three inventions, it's an extremely hard piece to play. It's very virtuosic and it's not very easy for the conductor. I say that from personal experience, having conducted it not as well as I would like several times. Um, it was a very important piece in my evolution because in more recent years since then, yes, yeah, since a lot, 25 years, gosh, 25 years since I wrote it, my music has been more um, polyphonic, less purely disposed towards the harmonic element, though the harmonic element is still extremely important, but very more, much more linear and more polyvalent, more multidimensional in structure through that. And that's complicated to work. And this is one of the first pieces when I was starting to deal with a, I could say more objective framework or frame scaffolding behind the music. Thing which, which was very initially foreign to me when I was young, when I thought, freedom and inspiration was all that mattered. So it was a very important piece in my evolution. It's like a concerto for ensemble for 24 players. Uh, everybody has an important solo moment. Um, there are three movements, very unbalanced movements intentionally. There's a very short and quite sweet luminous movement written in memory of Messiaen, written shortly after he died, four minutes. Then there is a fast sort of scherzo, quite acrobatic in the wind writing and loud, two and a half minutes. And then there's this monster 10 minutes, which is very, very dark and quite frightening in the atmosphere. And it slowly evolves and builds and it's quite ominous and, temp and sort of dark and not so pleasure pleasant in atmosphere. And, uh, I was quite interested while conceiving the piece of having, as it were, quite an innocent first third of a piece and then having a monster unexpectedly. In other words, the opposite of classical form where things are balanced. Uh, you, you talk about scherzo and classical form and, uh, and messy. And, uh, what is your relationship to tradition, uh, to the classical tradition? So, for, for example, uh, the beginning of three inventions sounds quite tonal. Um, so, so, and, and, and I know you worked for IRCAM where, you know, even, even doubling octaves was kind of prohibited or, so, yeah. <laughs> um, um, 
are octaves are wonderful, mysterious things. There's a lot of octaves in, in my music. Okay, you have to think what it was like then. In the, you probably weren't there in the late 70s and 80s. Oh, this was 90s. Serialism had, and the language of serialism had become rather academic at this point. And though I greatly respect some serial music, enormously respect and have learned a lot from it. I didn't, it didn't sing and speak the type of music that I wanted. And I've always been interested in having a very wide harmonic palette, which can be very consonant and very simple and immensely complicated and diffracted into five or six different layers later on in the piece. And that desire was, I suppose, yes, encouraged by Messiaen. That was, the, in fact, that was the point of contact between us that most of the other students didn't want to talk harmony with him. I was so fascinated to discuss harmony with this great harmonic master. Um, my language has moved on. My approach to form has completely moved on. But at the same time, I like the idea of having a wide uh, harmonic palette and therefore perhaps a wide expressive palette. And I don't believe in the serial desire for complete purity and a, a, a certain degree of, um, what's the, let me find the right word, excuse me, of um, an excessive degree of homo homogeneity in, in language and um, a sort of uh, hermetic language. So, the beginning of this piece, yes, it's consonant. Yes, there are octaves, but actually what key is it in? You, you can't really say, because it's, uh, uh, the way it's organized intervallically is based on uh, the study of, uh, forgive me for being technical, enharmonic connections between <laughs> And hemi and and hemitonic pentachords. It's awful. But what it means is groups of notes which don't have semitones, which glide into one each other through common tones, but don't settle enough for enough time that they establish a a a, a, a um, stable tonal so-called so centre. And so throughout this piece, there are areas, some, at the beginning, it's very clear because it's homogenous. It's just one perspective. But in the third invention, there's about eight different types of harmony going on simultaneously. One or two of them are, ex one or two of them are extremely constant. One of them is made in, out of major and minor triads in, in melodic form. Others are made out of pen, uh, pentatonic uh, or uh, groups, four notes, chords, with their octaves. So um, it might give the feeling of being tonal, but it isn't tonal. It's not goal-directed. There's no relation to dominance. Uh, the approach of these consonances and the relationship to the whole structure is absolutely not that of tonal music. And they're simply one ingredient amongst some other things which can be extremely harsh or extremely opaque or extremely milky or ext uh, other things which are potentially able to mutate horizontally or superimpose vertically. Forgive this very long um, response. But I suppose in the end was to have a degree of freedom, which doesn't in essence ban anything. It's what you do with it than what it, than what it is, which is a different philosophy from the mid 20th century approach to serialism and that type of constructivism. Well, thank you very much for the interview. <laughs> I mean, I th th thank you.